Uh, when I go to an academic event, and it's always strange to me when they don't pray. <laughs> when somebody gets up there, okay, we're about to pray, and we'll get going, and they just get going. I can't do that. Lord, we ask that you would open our understanding to you. Uh, and if there is anything good, anything useful, anything that is truly reflective of what you're doing in your heavenly kingdom, then pray that this time together, this talk, would be to those ends that we might be shaped more in the image you've made us for, the image of the Lord Jesus. Amen. In his last uh, public published interview in May of 1963, C.S. Lewis died in November of 1963, the interviewer asked, what do you think is going to happen in the next few years of history, Mr. Lewis? And having learned great humility, he replied, I have no way of knowing. My primary field is the past. I travel with my back to the engine. And that makes it difficult when you try to steer. The world might stop in ten minutes. Meanwhile, we're to go on doing our duty. The great thing is to be found at once post as a child of God, living each day as though it were our last, but planning as though our world might last a hundred years. We have, of course, the assurance of the New Testament regarding events to come. I find it difficult to keep from laughing when I find people worrying about future destruction of some kind or other. Didn't they know they were going to die anyway? Apparently not. Ironically, this backward-looking man was almost prescient, prophetic, with his sense of where society was moving. As he frequently recognized, he was out of step with his times, and he felt it. Yet, by taking reference from the past, being oriented to, to the past, he knew what changes had come and where those changes might lead. So, gazing to the distant past, he could discern our declension from straight and the unexamined assumptions that we've accepted that differ from ages past that have become part of our thinking, that were not part of theirs. And then, with his razor-sharp reasoning, he saw two steps ahead in the chain of logic. He saw the desire that would be birthed when the next restraint was cast off. Well, we've now caught up with where his prophetic sight had reached. We're living in the consequences of unheeded things, unheeded warnings. He was a man that was troubled by modernity. And we are living in the last gasps of late modernity. So, on this feast in honor of Brother Lewis, I want to let him comment on a matter of concern to all of us today. What would he say... To the issue we face of artificial intelligence creeping into so many areas of life and to social media's influence on our lives. So first I'm going to consider our problem. Then I'm going to present Lewis's commentary on such matters through a novel. Much of this will be a reading of one of his novels. And finally, with his help, I'll posit some critical pathways for us who belong to the kingdom of Christ. So now to the problem. Artificial intelligence can refer to a wide variety of machine activity. Much of it is undoubtedly helpful. Don't hear me as a Luddite on this. So on the most helpful end, AI includes rapid detection and diagnosis of diseases. It's including certain cancers based on vast data sets and data analysis has a powerful predictive quality. AI includes all sorts of developments to save costs by eliminating the need for human workers. Of course, this means large sectors of unskilled labor are disappearing as robots are now assembling products 
and moving them with the product, with the prospect of also um, delivering them with self-driving trucking. No more truckers. Perhaps that's all beneficial. But what about the subconscious stuff that's happening? So more dubiously, artificial intelligence includes sentence completion while you're typing. You've all recognized this. It, it happens to all of us based on typical patterns. So by completing ideas for you or completing your search requests, your thought gets funneled into a narrower and narrower stream. Your creativity, your curiosity gets channeled into what most people think, ask, say. So we also find an AI that selects or suggests music for you, or that recommends YouTube videos or products that you especially would like. So that's based on a developing profile of you. Where is this profile held? <laughs> Based on this profile, you're offered more consumption, automated news feeds, tailored searches that guide your reading. And so there's a whole realm of AI that's devoted to encouraging and shaping your, and I mean you individually, your continual consumption of media, of products, of experiences, of ideas. And now we find ourselves in science fiction. You are undoubtedly aware of alarms raised by AI in the realm of warfare, wherein technologies of self-guided drones employ programmed situational ethics, deciding when it's right to shoot an actual human, when it's right to bomb the militaries of all the global powers are working on constructing robot soldiers. That used to be science fiction. This is reality. Finally, artificial intelligence has opened the door to personal relationship with non-living images and machines. There are layers to this. The technology we're facing, it ranges from conversations with a computer that draws from all of internet language for its ideas to animated in images that, that likewise are imitating images and activities that it finds across the internet. To robotics that learn to move and interact with a person. So for several years now, the Japanese have given over and hired the care of their elderly to robot companions because they are too busy to be present with them. Americans have been more interested in the potential for personal pleasure and personal relationship with machines. If you have looked into the subject at all, you've probably turned away with a shudder at the horrific potential here. So what used to be far-fetched science fiction is becoming reality. Oscar Wilde was right. When you remove moral restraints from the equation, which he was all for, life imitates art. We live into what our imaginations have produced. Then, of course, uh, at the same time that the tech companies are warning about the need for regulation and they're going before Congress and asking for regulation, they drive ahead without restraint lest another company get ahead and get market share. All the while saying, stop us! Stop us from destroying the world. Well, 80 years ago, C.S. Lewis was thinking about these kinds of scenarios. As World War II drew to a close, he was pondering the trajectories that had led to that conflict and where those could lead in the future. And as he always did, he did not consider the world of ideas in isolation from cosmic realities. 
from the biblical worldview, the principalities and powers that were at work in World War II were still at work and would bring a fresh assault when time and opportunity allowed. We come to the fiction now. In the final installment of the Space Trilogy, called The Hideous Strength, Lewis crafted something like a literary expose uh, of certain insidious elements in modern science. Uh, and this, he conceived, this would be the battleground between the kingdom of God and the powers of darkness in late modernity. My own heading for this, this insidious effort is the dehumanizing of human life. The dehumanizing of human life. As Lewis shows in this novel, the effort of modern science is an extension of the modern impulse generally to innovate and innovate and innovate, driving forward with whatever is quicker, easier, less painful, so as to eliminate whatever is slow, weak, and difficult for human life. The death, of course, must also be overcome. But until that can be attained, attention will be given to just the incommodities of everyday life. The incommodities that lead to death. So as Lewis always does, he forces the question, well, what's left when that's done? What's left when that's achieved? What comprises this ideal life we seem to be aiming at? And... He insists that we must ask, who is behind the drive? Who's behind all this? In case you've not read the book, many people have not read that it is strength or the space trilogy. When you get into them, the, if you're young, you'll find the language is difficult. Uh, it's, he's working for one in fields that he was not terribly familiar with, science, being a medieval and renaissance historian. And literary critic. Uh, so let me borrow a summary from former Church of England Archbishop Rowan Williams. The setting of that hideous strength is a small university town, Edgestow. In Edgestow, one of the colleges, Bracton, owns a historic piece of woodland which various people are unaccountably eager to get their hands on. A new group the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments, the NICE, N-I-C-E, are about to set up their institute near Edsto, and they wish to acquire the college's land. One of the young fellows at Bracton, Mark Studdock, is a major figure in the novel. He is lured to assist the institute in their work, but meanwhile, his rather estranged wife, Jane, becomes involved with another group of people who clearly represent values utterly at odds with those of the nice and their headquarters at Belbury. The novel is about the conflict between the group in which Jane becomes involved at St. Anne's on the Hill, centered around the mysterious figure of Ransom, and the group around the nice at Belbury. The interest of the story turns on Mark Studdock, the young academic sociologist, and the saving of Mark's soul. At the climax of the book, interplanetary angelic powers are drawn into battle to bring about the destruction of the Nice and Belbury, indeed of much of Edgesto too, as a result of the mediation of the strange figure of Merlin, who has been kept in cold storage for many centuries under Bragdon Wood. He returns to full life and becomes the agent of the heavenly powers which bring about the destruction of the evil forces at Belbury. Very ambitious. I think this is his most uh, ambitious work, in which he tries to include uh, so many streams of thought that he has given time to. Our interest today is in the vision of the nice, the vanguard of scientific development for the good of humanity. As Mark is about to be brought into the inner circle of the organization and shown what it's really all about, one of the lead scientists draws back the curtains, literally draws back curtains, to gaze on the moon. And there on the bare surface, he explains, success has been achieved. 
There is an advanced race slowly spreading their hygiene over the whole globe. Following their model, this institute, he goes on, is for something better than housing and vaccinations and faster trains and the curing of people of cancer. It is for the conquest of death or for the conquest of organic life, if you prefer. It is to bring out of the cocoon of organic life, which sheltered the babyhood of mind, the new man. The man who will not die, the artificial man, free from nature. So, driving the experiments of the nice is the aim of uncoupling existence from body, separating being from embodiment. And a select group, especially initiated men, will be given this opportunity to live a disembodied life without limit, ruling over the mass of flesh-bound mankind until their existence is no longer necessary. Another member of the organization who speaks kind of the religious side, the religious language, chimes in. It is the beginning of man immortal and man ubiquitous. Man on the throne of the universe. It's what all the prophecies really meant. Well, as a purely secular academic, Mark is for a moment allured by the vision. He has no moral defenses. He has no framework for good or evil and sorting that out. He's been trained in academia, trained to accept unquestioningly anything soaked in the language of progress, and he willingly entertains the offer of the nice to take a place in their efforts. But most significantly for him is the delight of being led into a secret. Being part of a special group, the elite, he accepts then their offer of being in the innermost circle. Now, he finds then, pursuing their vision of disembodied life, the experiments of the nice have brought them to isolate a human head, weird, mounted on a wall, and sustained by artificial means, a disembodied head with enhanced brain speaks to Mark and demands his allegiance. Most of the scientists that are involved in these experiments, they believe that the intelligence of this head is a now liberated version of its original owner, a scientist named Alcacen. We learn later that it is controlled by demonic forces that use it through which to speak. Once he's seen the head, Mark is invited into a circle within the inner circle, wheels within wheels. Here, the vision is explained more fully by one of these leaders of the nice, Frost. Casting vision for Mark, he says, the effect of modern war is to eliminate retrogressive types while sparing the technology and increasing its hold upon public affairs. In the new age, what has hitherto been merely the intellectual nucleus of the race is to become, by gradual stages, the race itself. You are to conceive the species as an animal which has discovered how to simplify nutrition and locomotion to such a point that the old complex organs and the large body which contain them are no longer necessary. That large body is therefore to disappear. Only a tenth part of it will now be needed to support the brain. The individual is to become all head. The human race is to become all technocracy. The large population has served its function by acting as a kind of cocoon for technocratic and objective man. So let me clarify what he said. Modern war is to kill off undesirable people while creating new technologies 
and enslaving the remaining population to the technology. The unfolding result will be ever more technologically dependent people. And the last step will be to give artificial life to the few victors. Let's be impressed for a moment. In 1946, C.S. Lewis comprehended modern science was motivated towards artificial intelligence. That the aim of some sectors would be to merge actual human life with technology. It wouldn't be until 1960 that the term cyborg was coined. It was in a New York Times article. May 1960, first defined a cyborg is essentially a man-machine system in which the control mechanisms of the human portion are modified externally by drugs or regulatory devices so that the being can live an environment different from the normal one. As you may be aware, Today, this is precisely the stated goal of several cutting-edge, for-profit scientific companies. Uh, a recent survey of the field states it boldly. A transhumanist beyond human, a transhumanist future where humans develop technology to transcend their biological limitations is not in the realm of science fiction any longer. The next phase of augmentation is implanting or hosting different technology elements in a person's body, such as wearable devices, which is already used to gather biometric data or to interact with devices, followed by enhancing intellectual and physical limitations to redefine the human experience. As human enhancement technologies open up tremendous new possibilities, they will raise important questions about what it means to be a human. End quote. Goldman Sachs investment company forecasts that investment in AI technologies next year will reach $200 billion. Companies like Google, OpenAI, DeepMind, Meta, XAI are, are in competition for that investment. And so the pace of competition means anyone who has ethical qualms working in those organizations has hesitancies, must set them aside or get behind, lose out on the investment. So as the novel demonstrates, the unmasked vision of human life as unlimited, death-defying cyborgs, imagined by the lead scientists, is not part of our popular conversation. That's not what we're aiming at. Most people find those thoughts revolting. It's the horrific side of science fiction. What everyday folks are interested in is any kind of technological development that makes existence easier or more pleasurable in the short term. So in his inaugural lecture on receiving the chair of Renaissance Literature at Cambridge, Lewis described this feature that we live, this feature of modernity. Why does latest, he says, in advertisements always mean best? I submit that what has imposed this climate of opinion so firmly on the human mind is a new archetypal image, a guiding image. It's the image of old machines being superseded by new and better ones. For in the world of machines, the new most often really is better and the primitive really is clumsy. And this image, potent, powerful in our minds, reigns almost without rival in the minds of the uneducated after their marriage and the births of their children, the very milestones of life are technical advances. From the old push bike to the motorbike, that's to the little car. From gramophone to radio, from radio to television to handheld device. 
from the range to the stove. These are the very stages of their pilgrimage. But whether from this cause or from some other, assuredly, that approach to life which has left these footprints on our language that do is best is the thing that separates us most sharply from our ancestors and whose absence would strike us as most alien if we could return to their world. That is, in pre-modern times, they, we would find uh, that this idea had no hold, that new was better. In fact, the opposite was true. New was suspect. End quote. Incrementally, each technology we find is welcome if it can entertain, if it can take away pain, physical or emotional, if it can sexually please or keep the body going with less effort. Technologies are welcomed if they save us a step, if they save physical labor, if they lessen emotional discomfort from just normal human interaction. Moderns simply accept what is new. It's unlikely that anyone here, anyone who's a reader of C.S. Lewis's works, is consciously inclined towards rejecting the body and in favor of put on, putting on a cyborg existence. I could be wrong about you. <laughs> Even the secular sociologist Mark Studdock in the novel is put off by the fully unveiled vision. But long before that, long before he's put off, his enthusiasm is awakened and his willingness to join the nice and its program is won by preliminary links in the chain. He's a convinced martyr because he's already committed to the rejection of the past and the past ways of doing things. He eagerly accepts the public plan of the nice. His recruiter shares the outline. Hear this. A real education, including prenatal education, makes the patient what we want infallibly. Whatever he or his parents try to do about it. Of course, it'll have to be mainly psychological at first. But we'll get on to biochemical conditioning in the end and direct manipulation of the brain. Hmm. Immersive psychological condition. Biochemical condition. In 1946, Lewis already perceived that for common people to remove their inhibitions about direct manipulation of the self, there would have to be a process of desensitizing. People would have to slowly welcome the integration of their personal self with technologies. And that would require creating a sense of need. A sense of deficit. That could only be met by the technologies. So for a change so directly against our basic understanding of being a human being. People must be made to want the loss of autonomy. To want and ask for less personal agency. In a horrible paradox, they must want to control their world so much that they give up control completely. Lewis painted that process in very broad strokes here. He called it re-education. What has actually come to be in recent years is called social media. I am hesitant to make this argument because I don't want to be thought of as old and out of touch. And I want you to like me, especially young people like Mark Studdock. I don't want to be one of the outsiders. I don't want to be thought as that. But the consequences are too important to ignore. We judge a tree by its fruit, and the effects of social media, including, this gets personal, Facebook, Twitter, X, whatever it is, Instagram, TikTok, in offering 
little rewards of safety and amusement with tiny gifts of dopamine, the technology creates dependence. This is not what you intended. Dependence, people of all ages, and now it's not, not just the young people. People of all ages report extreme levels of anxiety when cut off from their device for even a few hours. It's not, it's not just that one might miss a call or miss a communication. In terms of that hideous strength, psychological and biochemical conditioning has occurred. It has happened. You are in it. There is a felt need for the technology. In point of fact, millions of people are asking, are demanding less freedom. The desire to control discomfort has led to submission to technology and to drugs. And to the drug-like effect of technology. So trying to manage low-level discomfort which is common to the human experience, we're surrendering en masse to much higher levels of control and manipulation. It's such a paradox. I don't want to feel bored for a moment, and so I surrender my freedom as a human being for life. Currently, 41 states are suing Meta, the owner of Facebook and Instagram, for purposely, knowingly, using psychological manipulation on teenagers and creating biochemical conditioning on purpose. Implicit in the lawsuit is an admission that parents have no control, cannot adequately regulate their children's social media use, and so the government must step in to protect their kids. However you judge the merits of the case, uh, I'm not arguing that. What it proves is there's a national awareness that social media is harmful. But Lewis is helping us see that it's merely a link in a chain of reasoning. It's merely a, a step in a process of dehumanization. So the theme of that hideous strength is not that science itself is bad. Rather, it's that Technology has become the battleground. We might say even the principal strategy by which real malevolent evil is seducing and destroying humanity. That's his argument. The war will certainly be won by the creator of all. But lest we be among those who are deceived by the enemy, we need to be awake and aware of what's going on in the spiritual realm. Experiencing the power of technological possibility. Being among the few in control, that is the allure. It's the hideous strength. Lewis describes it here. Here, surely, at last, was the true inner circle of all. The circle whose center was outside the human race transcending the human race, the ultimate secret, the supreme power, the last initiation. So what Lewis does for us here is shock us into alertness. It's like a froggy marsh wiggle stamping his nasty foot on a fire to pull us out of the frenetic pace of development so that we see the trajectory, so that we just think about it. Only by looking back, he shows us, can we see the incredible turn that we've taken. Modern technology, late modern technology for us, it's being driven by the aim of separating the inner person from the body. And in that pursuit, the mass of people will become servants of tech-driven bodily pleasure, will suffer failed attempts to reinvent the body until the body itself becomes hateful. 
and we want to reject it altogether. The transgender rejection of one's biological sex is only an early symptom of attempts to reinvent a hated body, a body that just constrains us. So what then does he suggest we do in such a battle? In very transparent terms, he shows that it will be God who wins the cosmic spiritual battle. But in the midst of it, his people are to draw together. Now, I've focused the discussion so far on the doings and the deceptions of the nice. But in the novel, their work is countered by another group gathered around Dr. Ransom the protagonist of the first two novels in the Space Trilogy. They assemble at this place, St. Anne's on the Hill, the heart of ancient Britain. What they do there is a significant argument in itself. All around them is in turmoil. The nice is buying up land, tearing down houses like Saruman in the Shire. All the while, St. Anne's on the Hill is carrying on an alternate life. The house at St. Anne's on the Hill is a metaphor for kingdom life. Standing on the highest ground for miles and miles around in the region, set within ancient walls, St. Anne's is described as a sort of hamlet with stables and greenhouses, orchards, vegetable gardens, and flower gardens. Within these walls, there's a circle of people who've come together for mutual support and refuge. <coughs> Some of them have had their houses taken by the nice. Jane Studdock, Mark's wife, comes for safety and discovers truth. But most importantly, what they do there is wait. They're waiting for movements beyond anything that they themselves can affect. They wait for truth to be revealed. Jane has a sort of spiritual gift of prophetic vision. And they wait for the heavenly powers to act. There's a rationalist there, McPhee, who says, You may wonder how any man in his senses thinks we're going to defeat a powerful conspiracy by sitting here growing vegetables and training performing bears. There's a bear that lives there. The answer is always the same. We're waiting for orders. He's a little annoyed by ransom. But how they wait is important. They wait actively by living a pre-modern life. So in this context, what I mean by that is they are oriented, their disposition is to the past. It's like Lewis described his own orientation to life. My field is the past. I travel with my back to the engine. Uh, in his academic work, The Discarded Image, Lewis explained that pre-modern man turned to the past to understand how to live in the present. Truth, once discovered, would always give life for the new day. He considered, Lewis considered himself a representative of that way of life, um, that way of being, that way of thought. To his Cambridge students in his lecture, he said, I myself belong far more to that old Western order than to yours. Where I fail as a critic, I may be useful as a specimen. As if having a dinosaur in the room would not be good for lecturing, but would be interesting to study. <laughs> Certainly, this was the experience of people who knew him that in relationship with him, they encountered a pre-modern way of life, a pre-modern way of thought. Reading old texts with him, they had access to that world as if they were experiencing it, along with a contemporary of that time. At St. Anne's on the Hill, the company there has just such an experience as a household with Dr. Ransom. They read old books. They drink lots of tea. They take turns of chores in the garden and in the kitchen. They cook. They eat. They talk long and deeply. They listen attentively and they pray. 
This life is the antithesis to the nice in the novel. It's fully embodied, simple presence. And here, I think, is Lewis's argument for us. Amidst a world that's driven by demonic desire to dehumanize, driven to force us into ultimate isolation with our technologies, broken off from one another, we make war by being together in the simplest ways. We rehumanize by doing normal people stuff. Normal human things together. Countercultural simplicity in our age is startlingly easy if you catch an imagination for it. Shockingly easy to be a radical. So for Christians, Living in an age of technological saturation, where we're always tethered to electronic devices, we're always tethered to entertainment, amusement, images, we can directly undermine this impact, the impact of this movement by drinking tea and coffee together. We do battle by having real conversations. By really listening to each other. Really talking through problems. Thinking through the next step in logic. When we read books and we discuss them together. We're fighting for what's everlasting. It doesn't feel like warfare. It is. Getting together and playing board games. Singing. Or playing music together. Or just wasting time with other flesh and blood people without the mediation of technology. Is combat with the current agenda and the powers of darkness. So just being bodily present powerfully affirms the gifts that God has given that are good. Our Kids can be radical kingdom presences, can be countercultural simply by talking face to face, and radically by not having social media. Parents, this is where you feel the war at home. The most painful betrayals in communist countries and in the communist era were when indoctrinated kids turned their parents in for having a fight. Hmm. The war's at home. Our kids are following someone's lead. Is it yours? They're following someone. Is it you? It is not my intent to tell you how to parent. It is my intent to warn you. I am warning you right now. If you, if you think this is just a talk, I'm warning you. Lewis was fond of the metaphor of a line. If there is no straight line elsewhere, how do we discover that another line is crooked? Likewise, it's by a different standard. It's by the inheritance of the Christian tradition. By what we've received of the faith, by the unchanging truth of Scripture, by the light of natural law, that we can sense how the ways of today and our times are out of joint. It's by the straight line we discern the crooked. Looking back, we see the bend in the road. We see how we've gotten off track. C.S. Lewis stubbornly insisted that he wasn't looking to the future. He, he was lying. <laughs> His keen awareness of the past showed him where and how our culture was going. Where and how it had diverted. And from there, it's merely an exercise of logic. Which he was very good at. To imagine where we were leading. He left us a prophetic warning in that hideous strength. 
We are now living what he feared. But the battle plan is the same. It's the same as it's always been. And I close with this. Moses said to Israel, when the greatest technology of his, technologies of the age were bearing down on them in the chariots of the Egyptians, and they stood on the edge of the Red Sea, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Well, the Lord said to King Jehoshaphat, when Judah was assailed by a vast army of Edomites and Ammonites, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance of the Lord. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be still. Amen. Amen. The end.